All right, today we are going to take a look at section 9.2. Um, 9.2 is titled Multi-Stage Experiments. So last time in section 9.1, we talked about some simple experiments like drawing a single card out of a deck of cards, right? What's the likelihood of it being hearts? Or rolling a specific number or a type of number like evens on a six-sided die. How likely is that? But in all of our experiments, it was a single trial experiment. We only did whatever we were doing one time. We only drew one card. We only, we only rolled one die or, or rolled one die one time. Um, so every experiment we only did in one, at one point in time, okay? So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to do an experiment where it repeats itself. So maybe we draw two cards. Um, or maybe we talk about an experiment where instead of having one child, we have two children, and we look at the genders of those children. Um, so everything is going to be in multi-stages, so either two or three. I don't think our book goes any bigger than three experiments. If it does, it might get to four, but it's not going to get any larger than that. So let's take a look at how that sort of plays out and how we think about it. And in particular, we're going to be working heavily with something called a tree diagram. So a tree diagram is a sample space model where each outcome is designated by a separate branch. In a one-stage experiment, like I mentioned before, the experiment is over after one step, which is one set of branches. It's not a very exciting tree. But with a two-stage experiment, or if we go further, but for two stages, the experiment will be over after two steps, which is two sets of branches. I promise I'm going to show you one at the very bottom of your notes page. You can see there's a big old space, and we're going to do one down the bottom of that. Um, but a few details before we get to that on how tree diagrams sort of work. Um, there's a multiplication rule for tree diagrams. Theorem 9-6. And it says for all multi-stage experiments, the probability of an outcome along any path of a tree diagram is equal to the product of the probabilities along that path. Um, we have talked about the fundamental principle of counting in here, I think. Sometimes my classes start to run together, so if, uh, if I'm saying something that's not true or applicable to a different class, I apologize for that. Um, but the idea that if I do one outcome and then I do another outcome, I multiply those outcomes together. That's all this says, is that the probabilities of things can be multiplied. Okay, and I'll show you that with um, the tree diagrams. Um, there's a note on this, and this is true um, for all of the problems we work with. Expect to see tree diagrams or something equivalent. And there are a few cases where maybe it doesn't quite look like a tree diagram, but it has the, a similar structure on all of your work. This is what you would have your students do. Um, so please allow space to do that. So I know some of you, when you aren't sure how to do a problem, like to skip spaces and then keep working so your problems stay in order. You probably, if you're going to do that, want to make sure you skip ample space because tree diagrams tend to take up a lot of space, okay? Um, all right, independent events. I actually mentioned this last time. Independent events are events where the occurrence of one event has no influence on the outcome of the second event. Um, and we mentioned that at the very end with um, a student who wanted to, I can't remember if it was roll a die or flip a coin. I think it was flip a coin. And he had gotten, uh, you know, tails so many times in a row, so he thought it would be more likely to be heads the next time because he'd had so many tails. Um, and I used the phrase independent event. You know, this flip of the coin has nothing to do with the next flip of the coin. There's no effect on that. Um, if I have a boy or a girl when I have my first baby, there's absolutely no way of that affecting whether I have a boy or a girl the second time I have a baby. All right? So there are, however, events that are not independent. So imagine that I put all of your names in a hat and I drew out one person's name, right? Well, as long as I don't put the name back in, right, so I draw out Demi's name, it means that it's changed the sample space that I now have inside of the experiment. Does that make sense? So then all of a sudden now on, on draw two, Kira's name is more likely to be drawn than it was on draw one because there's fewer names in the bucket to draw from. So those would not be independent events because the outcome of the first event actually affected the second event that we looked at or the event's second outcome. Um, when we do have independent events, however, the probability of both events occurring 
um, simultaneously or one after one another is simply the probability of each event occurring and being multiplied. And we'll see this coming about as we're working in our tree diagrams. So I feel like I need to show you a tree diagram so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example. An executive committee consists of 10 members, four women, six men. Three members are selected at random to attend a meeting in Hawaii. Who wants to go? Me too. Me and Kimberlyn, we're going to go to Hawaii. Oh, and there we go. Bethany's going to join us. Okay. So um, they're selected at random. Um, but as you can imagine, kind of like my example just a moment ago with all of your names in a hat, once I take one person out at random, it changes what was in the basket, right? So these are not going to be independent events. All of my probabilities are going to be affected by what happened previously. The question asks us about, um, if you take a look at your next page, because that's where the questions are, it asks us about the gender of the people going, okay? What's the problem that all three are women, or the probability that all three are women? What's the probability that at least one man goes? This is, these are the questions we're answering. So that helps us to determine what we're actually examining in our argument. What we're examining is whether we've chosen men or women to go. Does that make sense? So as I'm selecting people out of the hat, the only distinguishing feature as related to the questions being asked is whether they're male or female. So when I draw my tree diagram, there's a couple of ways to draw it. So let me just show you the imagery before you draw anything down. That way you can decide how you want to draw it. Um, so when I draw mine, I usually draw mine like this with a dot on the left and then I draw two branches if there's two things, in this case male and female like this. So I draw my diagram so that they're opening from left to right. Some people like to draw their diagrams where they're opening from top to bottom. It probably depends on how you space things out in your paper as to what makes sense with your with your note taking and things like that. Okay, So pick an, a way that you would like yours to look and I'd like for you to draw a dot. And then this is our first draw. So we've got all the people's names in the hat and we reach in and we pick one out and it's either a man or a woman. So I'm gonna do M and W for man and woman. You could do M and F if you wanted to do male and female, it doesn't matter, okay? You could do B and G if you wanna do boys and girls. Really, it doesn't matter. All right, so what we're going to do each time we draw a branch, though, is we're going to write the likelihood that that branch was actually what was selected. So in the bucket right now to start with, how many men's names are in the bucket? Six. How many people are in the bucket total? Ten. So there is a six out of ten chance that I select a man the very first time, which means what's the chance for the woman? Four out of ten. And I would encourage you to leave them in their unreduced state because it's easier to track and make sure that you didn't forget somebody along the way if it's all out of 10, because there's 10 people I'm picking from, and I can see that I've accounted for everybody because the numerators, six and four, add to 10. Exactly, you got it. Okay, cool. So after I select that first person to go on the trip, I've got to reach back into the basket and select again. So from wherever you were, the end of each of those branches, you draw another set of branches. And if I were only having two people on the trip, this would be where I would end. And again, I've either selected a man or a woman at the end of each branch. But here's the deal. All those M branches are no longer 6 out of 10. And all those W branches are no longer 4 out of 10. Because whatever I selected the first time in this first set of branches is going to change what my bucket actually has. So I actually have to follow a branch along to see what happens. So let's assume that we're on this top branch. How many men's names are still left in the bucket? Only five. Is everybody with me on that? How many women's names are left in the bucket? Four. The same four, still on the top branch. If I'm on the top branch, it means that I have actually selected a man. So there's still four women's names. How many names are total in my bucket? Nine. So it's five out of nine and four out of nine if I'm along the top branch. But if I'm along the bottom branch, then I've selected a woman's name, right? 
how many men's names along the bottom branch are still in my bucket? Six. And how many women's names? Three out of nine. That's what I meant by saying that these are not independent events. The probabilities do not say fixed every time. They are fluctuating depending on where I am. This gets me two people on my trip, but I need three. So at the end of all of those four branches that I currently have, I'm going to draw another set of two branches. If you're like, man, I'm, I'm running out of space, make your branches long. The longer you make them, the more space you actually push yourself into. It helps out. You know it goes to the end of every pair of branches, right? M's and W's, yeah? Man, woman. Okay. But I got to be careful because I got lots of branches up to options at this point. So... If I go along the top branch, very top branch, for all of these actually, I've selected two men, correct? Okay, so along that part, I've selected two men, so how many men are left? Four. And how many women? Four. Out of how many total? There's only eight in our bucket now, and actually there's only eight on every branch. I mean, like, we could go back through and put eight, because I know I've already got two people going on my trip, right? Okay, let's look at our second set of branches. So right in here, whoops, to do that one. Right in here, what has happened along this second set of branches? Who's already on my trip? One man, one woman, right? So along the second pair of branches, if I'm sort of pairing them up at the end, the second pair of branches at the end, one man and one woman have been selected. So how many men are left? Five. And how many women are left? Three. And the cool thing is that that's actually the same thing that's on the next one too, right? This is one woman and one man selected. So those end probabilities are the same, five out of eight and three out of eight. And now my last pair of branches, how many of what, what's happened at that point? Two women, yeah, so two, men, two women have been selected. So how many men are left? Six, and how many women are left? Two. Okay, so when, it, when you're working one of these problems, I expect to see this to start with with all of the probabilities in place, okay? And, and sometimes the branches are really easy, like they're all one half. We'll do a branch diagram with that one in a minute. So the probabilities are not always so complicated. Here they are because the probabilities changed every time, right? So it really depends on the context as to how messy those probabilities are. Once I have this diagram, I'm able to answer these questions directly from my diagram. So the first question it asks me is the probability that all three are women. So in my diagram, where does that happen? The very bottom branch. And those three probabilities along that bottom, we multiply them. That's what it said over here in the multiplication rule for tree diagrams. If I want a single outcome along any branch, I multiply the individual outcomes along the branch for that total. So I will have 4 out of 10 times 3 out of 9 times 2 out of 8. Now we've worked with fractions. That was chapter 6, right? So we can simplify things without making it too terribly messy. Um, I don't really want to multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and then reduce. That's not an especially helpful way to do the problem. Um, so in the middle here, for example, the 3 and the 9, well, that's one-third, right? How about the 2 and the 8? That's one-fourth. How about the 4 and the 10? Two-fifths. Two and so even if you don't recognize any of the cross-multiple, you know, things you can cancel, that reduces it a lot. So straight across the top, I'd have 2. Across the bottom, I'd have 60. I think that's right. 
Yep. And then 2 out of 60 at the end would reduce one last time to being 1 out of 30, right? So you do want them reduced into their simplest form at the end. Um, if the values are given originally in fractions, keep them in fractions. If the values are given originally in decimals, keep them in decimals. Um, you're not in, in any way expected to simplify or to change things. Um, repeating values here are not especially friendly, and that's what this would give me. If I try to do 1 out of 30 in my calculator, I'm going to get something that's repeating. It's not very nice. So 1 out of 30 is a much better um, kind of an idea of what's going on. Now, part B, <clears throat> there's more than one way to do part B. Part B wants to know the probability that at least one man is selected. So the hard way to do this problem, although you'll get the right answer, but the hard way to do this problem is to go back over here and to find every branch that has at least one man and to calculate it and then to add all those branches together. So why do I say that that's the hard way to do that? That's why it's going to be easier to do it the other way. The reason that the one I suggested was hard is because there's a lot of branches that have at least one man on them, right? Yeah, that's why that's going to be messy. So, Demi, what would you suggest otherwise? Because you're on the right track. I would just, I don't know if this is right, but I would just go to A. And then okay. One out of 30 chances all women, there's 29 out of 30 chances that one man. Yeah, and there was a um, property last time that said this. It said that the, pro uh, the probability of A plus the probability of A complement is equal to 1. Do you guys remember that one? It was like the last in our series of like six different probability theorems or whatever. And you're exactly right, Demi. That's what we're looking at. So the probability that a certain thing happens is 1 minus the probability that it doesn't. And the opposite of having at least one man is having all women. In fact, it's the only way that doesn't happen, right? If I don't have all women, then I have at least one man going on the trip. So yeah, I can take 1 minus the 1 over 30, and Demi's right, that's 30 over 30, or a 29 out of 30 chance that at least one man's going on the trip. Okay, if you forget the property, you can still calculate it. You're just going to have a lot of work on your hands. It's going to be quite difficult to calculate by using all the other branches. So in our homework, if we just put like the 29 over 30, would that be full credit or do we need to see that work? Um, I would at least like to see the step that would be like right here. Probability of, um, and you could even write here of, of uh, hang on, like 1M. One, one we'll do it that way since I did man. So probability of one man would be 1 minus 1 over 30. Okay, so you want to see another example? One that doesn't involve a tree diagram, but a equivalent sort of looking thing that I mentioned, because I sort of threw that out there as like a, a weird statement. But I think you'll see what I mean when we get here. Okay, a box. A box contains five slips of paper, numbered 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. A player reaches into the box and draws out two slips and adds them up. If the sum is even, the player wins. If it's odd, the player loses. Everybody with me? So, like, I could actually draw a tree diagram, and it would have to have one, two, three, four, five branches, because there's five possibilities, right? So each of the five branches would have five branches. And then off of each of the five branches, it would have four more branches. That's a pretty big tree diagram, right? So another thing that I could do is I could simply look for the pairs that I have here. So what are my options? What are the possible things that could actually happen? Well, I mean, I could draw a four and a six, right? I could draw a four and a eight. I could draw a four and a nine. Did I lift? Oh, wait, we skipped seven. Hang on. Just so that they're all there and I don't forget it. I'm going to go back and put seven in. Four, seven, four, eight, and then four, nine. Everybody with me? Those are the only possibilities that I can draw that have a four in them, right? 
Because if you imagine this, it really doesn't matter if I draw the four first or second, I'm adding the numbers together. It's irrelevant, correct? So these are all my four something combinations, but maybe I don't draw a four. What else could I have drawn? A six and a seven, or a six and a eight, or a six and a nine. But then that's all my six possibilities. What else could I have drawn? Seven and eight, or seven and nine, or eight and nine. So it's not a tree diagram, but in some fashion I've listed out every possibility. And they're all equally likely because they're all just pieces of paper in a bucket, right? There's not like, you know, one of them's more fun to feel and so we're pulling it out first or, you know, somehow, oh, look, the pink one, it's on pink paper and so I like pink better, I'm pulling out the pink paper. None of that's going on. They're all equally likely. So these are all equally likely possibilities. How many possibilities are there here? 10? So I have 10 different outcomes that could happen. But the issue is that some of the outcomes I will win and then some of the outcomes I will lose. And it's all hinged upon doing what with those two numbers? Adding them up, right? Yeah? Adding them up and whether they're even or whether they're odd. So what I really want to know is I really want to know when I add all these up, what do I get? So this one would be 10, 11, 12, 13, 13, 14, 15, 15, 16, and 17. So while it's equally likely to draw any of those 10 individual, you know, number combinations, basically, it's not necessarily equally likely to draw an even or an odd sum. So what do I have to do to win? It needs to be even to win. So how many of the 10 options are even? One, two, three, and four. That's what I got too. Four out of 10, which would reduce to two fifths, right? So I have a two fifths chance of actually winning with these conditions in place. But part B asks a different question. It says, does the probability change if you were multiplying the numbers? And if so, what would that probability become? So everywhere I put those little blue numbers, I wrote mine in blue where I multiplied them. I wanna go back now and I wanna, instead of adding the numbers together, I wanna to multiply the numbers together. So I'm gonna write down the outcomes below, try to get them in sort of the same location. I think I have space, no, nope, I don't. This one's only here. So I have four times six would be 24, close. It's okay. Uh, four times seven, 28. Four times eight, 32. Uh, four times nine, 36. Six times seven, 42. Six times eight, 48. Uh, six times nine, Oh, wait, what did we have? Six, six and nine. Sorry, I was thinking four and nine. Six and nine was what? 54, thank you. Uh, seven and eight? 56. Seven and nine? 63. And the last one is eight and nine? 72. 72. I was just quizzing you guys today. <laughs> you all did pretty good. All right, so... Does the probability change? That's the first question, and the answer is yes, it certainly does. And if so, what does it change to? What number now do I have? Nine out of 10. It is 9 out of 10. Now, we just went through and we multiplied them all out, right? I mean, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I contend I don't really need to have multiplied them out to know my answer. Um, and I just want to show you that as a reminder of um, some number facts we do this in number theory, but I know not all of you have taken that. Um, just go back and look at the pairs of numbers where I have them sort of written in black. Everything that's multiplied by an even will be even. And that's all of those. 
So even without actually multiplying them and caring, did I get 54 or 56 in those cases, right? I don't really care if I got 54 or 56. I know it's going to be even because anytime you multiply by an even number, you get an even number. So you wouldn't necessarily have had to find the fact the, the um, products out like I did in, in the blue on the very bottom. You could have just looked back and counted where am I multiplying by even numbers. But either way, you'll still get 9 tenths. Okay? Any questions on that one? All righty. We should do another one. And then this will be our last one for today, example three. Suppose an experiment consists of spinning the first spinner followed by the second spinner. Okay, so the first spinner has one and two on it, and they're equal, right? Equally distributed. Um, and then one, two, and three, and at least it should lend you to believe that they're equally distributed. That's how I tried to make my picture, okay? And part A wants to know what is the sample space for the experiment. So sample space, if you'll remember, shows all possible outcomes. So a sample space for this um, is that on the first, that's terrible, that's better. On the first spinner, I could get a one. I'm going to write them as ordered pairs. You don't have to write them that way, but that's how I'm going to write them. And if I spin a one on the first spinner, what could I have spin on the second spinner? Another one. Or I could spin a one on the first spinner and a two, or a one and a three. Or maybe I don't spin a one on the first spinner, but I spin a two and a one, or a two and a two, or a two and a three. And because all of those diagrams, I mean, are equally likely distributions, right? All of those are equally likely probabilities. If you, if you were to write out a tree diagram for this, right? If I were to do this, I'd go, I've, I'm gonna spin a one or a two. And then from my one, I'm gonna get either a one or a two or a three. And from my two, I'm gonna get a one or a two or a three. And each of these probabilities at the beginning would be a one-half because it's equally one-half and one-half on that spinner and the angles, right? And on the second roll, or spin rather, there would be a one-third probability on each of them. So if you multiply along any branch, you're multiplying one-half times one-third, which gives you one-sixth, right? And that makes sense. There's six different items in my sample space and they each have a probability of being one-sixth chosen or spun. Okay, everybody good so far? All right, let's look at the questions that are asked as a result now. We want to find the probabilities of spinning two even numbers. So looking over here, how many places do you see two even numbers on there? Just one, right? Two, two. Are you guys with me? Two even numbers spun. And we're not adding or multiplying on this one. We're just looking at the numbers that are spun. So there's, there's two, two. So that is a one out of whoops, one out of how many? A one out of six chance of spinning two even numbers. Double I spinning at least a one two. Well, which one of these have at least one two? Well, all three of those do. And that one. There's at least one, two in the combinations that are listed. So how many of those had it? Yep, four out of six, which reduces to two-thirds. Good job. And the last one says spinning exactly one, two. So where are the exactly one, twos? There's three of them, right? So I have two, one, one, two, and two, three. So there are three out of six, which reduces to one half of my numbers where I have exactly one two spun. And we will push pause right there for today. <laughs>